Hello everyone, this is your host, Professor Reha, and here we have part 4 of the Smite Beginner's Guide. Uh, I, sp I said that wrong. The Smite Beginner's Guide to Support. There we go. Um, this is going to be the last part of this particular series in which we don't have gameplay, but I thought it was very important we discussed Guardians, uh, why Guardians are frequently supports, and what you do if you want to play support out of role. Now, first off, let's talk about each of the classes in general and each of the roles. Now, if you've never played Smite, or for that matter, any MOBA, each one of the classes in Smite, Assassin, Warrior, Guardian, Mage, and Hunter, are all typically associated and designed around the needs of a specific role. For support, that is Guardian. For Assassin, for reference, Assassins are typically designed to be junglers. Hunters are usually designed to be ADCs, or attack damage carries if you don't know. Mages are typically designed to be mid laners, with certain exceptions that we'll talk about in a hot minute. And finally, warriors are intended to be solo laners. That is their intention. Now, what sets guardians apart from all the other classes in terms of their actual need to fulfill their role of support? Well, one of the more important things that a lot of people underestimate, but I personally find incredibly important, is default protections. Let's take him here for, in, for instance. Let's go to the God Builder and let's reduce his level down to 20. I'm sorry, down to 1. Now, notice for a minute that his default protections, physical is 26, magical is 31, right? And then we increase these all the way to 20, and we wind up with just shy of 90 physical protections and 50 magical protections, all right? By the way, also, it is very important to note this, because if you're building as a support, keep in mind that you will probably need a little bit more than average magical protections to actually get yourself in a decent magical protection spot. Just thought I'd throw that out there really quick. Okay, so we have that. Now, I want you to compare this to, say, let's take a hunter as an example. Let's talk about... Um... Why am I having a brain cramp on who the default hunter is? Neath. Why did I forget that? Notice her default protections are 15 physical protections and 31 magic protections. That's quite a substantial difference. And furthermore, that difference remains as drastic when you consider the level 20. While the magic protections roughly remain about the same for both, the physical protections are drastically different. It's about 12 or so less for Hunter's protections up to about, I believe it's actually just just over 15, I think it's 16, uh, physical protections less at the end game. Now, for hunters, it's not hugely important because they're supposed to be doing damage, they're supposed to be killing the enemy, they're not, not, they're not necessarily supposed to be absorbing the damage, but this is also one of the reasons why you really don't want your hunters and your mages to initiate at the beginning of the game. You will notice that I mentioned uh, mages as well in the previous uh, episode, and we're going to pull up Ra, here he is, and notice 70 uh, uh, physical protections, all the way up from a glorious 13 physical protections. Alright, so that can be quite a potential problem, and you may be wondering, well, Professor, it's just a matter of physical protections. Yes, it is just a matter of physical protections, but in the early game, Physical protections are actually pretty important because minions and towers do physical damage. Which is generally why, in most cases, I start off with physical protection boosts. Or at least something hybrid, like Gauntlet of Thebes, that will eventually pay off in physical protections. Because otherwise, the minions will start hitting you extremely hard. It is actually sometimes useful as a solo laner, for, which we'll talk about when I go through the Smite Beginner's Guide to Solos. Uh, it is sometimes more important for a solo laner to build physical protections, even if their laning opponent is magical. But this is something that you should really be aware of, and right now, at this point in the game, in the meta of the game, the meta being the currently most useful, the widely considered most useful items and characters, there is a lot more physical protections that you can easily squeak in to your early build, far easier than it ever has been. Mages could build Vampiric Shroud. Magic Solo Lanes could build Vampiric Shroud. 
mm, unusually aggressive supports could build Vampiric Shroud. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, you've also got the famous, we'll just go to the Assassins for Absolute Kicks. Uh, who is the opening Assassin Thor? That's right. You also could go for, for instance, the good old Warrior's Axe. A little bit of extra physical protections there. Or alternatively, you could pick up Mannequin Scepter. Physical protections, right? Even Hunters can build Mannequin Scepter and do fairly well for themselves with that. Although in the late game, it doesn't translate too well. But that's ultimately the reason why physical protections are so important, especially in the early game. So this is why playing a class out of role i.e. a class that is not being played in its designed role is somewhat potentially problematic depending on how you build, how you play, and the level of coordination between you and your allies. Now, back to the main point, let's talk about Guardians because there are two broad philosophies in terms of supporting. The usual philosophy of support is, as I've been discussing, throughout this series is, you know, body block for your allies, crowd control to protect your allies, initiation and counter-initiation to keep your allies safe while they eliminate the enemy. But there is a second philosophy, much less often used and quoted, um, which can basically be summed up as the best crowd control is death, which isn't necessarily wrong. The idea behind this is to build a support that is moderately tanky, and yet also can do some damage. This is usually called what is known as a hybrid build. You build some defense and some damage. Now, how effective that is depends extremely heavily upon what character you're playing as. Let's take a hot minute to talk about Ymir. Alright, let's go to the abilities because this really is going to determine a large amount of whether or not you can effectively hybridize a support. Now, first off, he's got Frostbite. His basic attacks against a target do double damage, right? 100% more damage, double damage, same thing. But let's take a look at some of his other abilities. Ice Wall does not do damage, so we don't need power here. And this is the important part, and I haven't really been talking about it a ton. Notice that there are, there is the damage listed, and then plus some percentage of magic power. There are specific titles for these. The damage there you see on the left, the 90, 160, 230, 300, and 370, this is known as the flat damage of an ability. Level 1 Glacial Strike, 90 damage, level 2, 160, level 3, etc. You've seen the abilities level up throughout gameplay. The plus 70% is literally a percentage of your magic power, right? So if I were to build, say, po oh, get that back there. I accidentally killed that. Say I built Polynomicon, Rod of Tahuti, uh, let's go with a hybrid. Uh, Sovereignty, let's make a fantasy build here. Uh, Shogun's Kusari, Mantle of Discord, and uh, Pestilence for Kicks. So if I were to build this, notice that my power is 235, right? This means that in this particular circumstance, ignoring protections for a minute here, we would have extra damage of 165 rounded up. We're not going to save that. So 165 extra damage plus the 370 would be 534, which isn't bad. Now, again, this does somewhat uh, rely on penetrations. We've talked about penetrations before. So, but ultimately, you know, that's what we're really talking about here. Now, a lot of guardians, most guardians, have really high flat damage but really low magic scaling, which is what that plus 70% of magic power is. That is called its scaling damage, because it scales with your magic power. Ymir is somewhat interesting in that he's actually got really good magic scaling. He's got 70% on Glacial Strike, he's got 50% on Frost Breath, and he's got 150% on Shards of Ice. So you can see where it would be very easy to build Ymir hybrid particularly if you're going attack speed, so you can take really great advantage of Frostbite. I'll talk about that when I get to Ymir. I'll eventually make a guide around Ymir. Don't worry about it for now. But I wanted to bring Ymir up as an excellent example of someone who can play hybrid, or, considering Frostbite and the Ice Wall and all of the crowd control, he can also play what is known as a pure support, which is how I've been talking for most of the time here, rather than a hybrid. Now... 
what makes the difference? How do you decide whether you can go pure support or if you can go hybrid support? Well, Ymir is fairly interesting in that he does both very well. And you might be wondering, but he plays hybrid so well, potentially speaking, if you build correctly, so how does he play pure support well? Well, consider his abilities. Frostbite. Enemies afflicted by a frostbite deal 10% less damage. Lasts for 6 seconds. Great. We have the Ice Wall. Block off the enemy. You have a slow on Glacial Strike. Not the best crowd control, but good enough. We have a stun on Frost, uh, frost Breath. Right? That is a nice 2.25 second stun. Not bad. And we have a slow on Shards of Ice when it does damage. So, while... Almost all of his abilities, except for his wall, deal really good damage. They also all apply some form of crowd control. And this is why Ymir is a really nice, versatile guardian. If you want to play hybrid with him, you can. If you want to play peer support, you can do that too. Even if you need to switch your intended design in the middle of a match. If I find that my team isn't dealing enough damage, I can slip in a little bit of power and a little bit of penetration and actually contribute in a very meaningful way to the damage output of the team. Or, if my team is doing plenty of damage and I find that going hybrid is getting them killed more often because I can't use my crowd control often enough or I don't survive long enough, I can switch to a full support and help my team that way. Now, I haven't mentioned this earlier because it is a bit more complicated. We're talking about advanced supporting right here. We're talking about switching from a hybrid support or a damage support. There's two different terms for it, but they both mean the same thing. Or a full or pure support, right? So, who doesn't switch very well? Well, consider, not an RDO, Athena, right? Athena's fairly interesting in that all of her abilities do damage, unlike Ymir. And she's got pretty decent scaling on these, except for Taunt. I'm um, sorry, Confound. 50, 50, 50... 90%, and she's got Reach, which deals 50% increased damage to the first enemy hit, right? She doesn't have as much crowd control as Ymir. In fact, she's only got two actual pieces of crowd control. She slows the enemy when she hits them with Preemptive Strike, which is her dash, and she has the very admittedly powerful Taunt from Confound. That's it. Her shield wall does not inflict any form of crowd control. This is 100% damage. Defender of Olympus, while it does incredible damage and does mitigate the damage that your chosen ally is taking for 3.5, uh, 3.6 seconds, it's not really necessarily fully intended to preserve your ally. It's kind of there to get Athena there quickly. This is actually what makes her a really interesting and potentially very impactful solo lane or jungler. But we're not going to worry about that now. We're talking about supports, but... She does build hybrid a little bit better than a lot of other supports. Now, on the other hand, let's talk about someone like Kepri. Kepri, you will notice, 40% uh, magic power, 5% magic power, 30% magic power. His ult doesn't do damage. Kepri plays hybrid badly. That's not to say it's not impossible to build him hybrid. It is, and I've done it before, and it's fairly interesting. But you will have a much harder time. And there, are, if you're going to be building hybrid anyways, why wouldn't you build hybrid with a guardian who plays it better? Uh, but Kepri makes for a fantastic pure support for a number of reasons, which you've probably already surmised, especially if you've seen my Kepri series. Fortitude provides enemies with a boosted 2% health shield, right? 2% of their health, by the way, not yours. You get your own health shield based on your health. Abduct. Pulls enemies in, increases your protections, and silences the enemy. In other words, all they can do while they're being abducted by you is attack. They can't move, they can't cast any abilities, they can't do anything but shoot you. Rising Dawn. If you use this on allies, they get damage mitigation. If you use this on enemies, physical protection to buff. Distance Root. A res, or possibly a pure escape. Everything Kepri does helps his allies or locks down an enemy. 100% of his kit. Everything. This is what makes him an absolutely incredible pure support. Right? So, other particular... Frankly, a lot of these can be built pure support. Whether or not I pref I'm sorry, uh, hybrid support. They all obviously technically can build pure support, but some of them do lend themselves better to hybrid support. 
Particularly famous examples are actually Cabracan, Cerberus, and Cthulhu, all of which have become famous as being very good at building hybrid. Now, you probably noticed last episode that everything Cabracan does basically does damage. We have a 50% here, we have a 50% here. This is a surprisingly high 35% for something that can last so long, and this is 70%. He does respectable amounts of damage, and all of his kit, except for his passive, does damage, so you have a lot of interesting options there. Cerberus has the same kind of deal but he also steals the enemy's healing, so that's a nice benefit that you don't even have to think about. Now, Paralyzing Spit looks like that 20% of your magic power is incredibly low, but you're actually shooting four projectiles, and if you hit the enemy with all four, that's actually a substantial amount of damage. It takes practice. He is definitely what I would call a higher skill. He, he takes more practice to use than a lot of other Guardians, so do keep that in mind. I would not recommend him as your first support. Unless you're extremely fond of dogs, Dobermans, or Cerberus as a character in general. But he is a bit more challenging because, you know, practicing the paralyzing spits range and point of impact are all very important, and that does take a lot of practice. Ghastly Breath, you've got low magic power, but this also reduces the enemy's magic protections. This, by the way, stuns if you can hit all four of the projectiles. This heals Cerberus, which is incredibly potent, and does very good damage itself, and this basically acts like a distance uh, pull. You hover everyone up, and then you put them down in an area wherever you choose, in front of you. So you can see from the abilities here that Cerberus makes both a great hybrid and a great pure support. Cthulhu, we've got Prey on Fear. If your enemies are insane, you get magic power. And the enemies do less damage to you, right? Sanity Break. He slows down their attack speed. He can inflict them with fear. This is the damage mitigation from the insanity. This slows and roots enemies. This just allows him to dash, increases their insanity. And this allows him to get massively huge, gains lots of health, and his abilities change. Uh, two of them are just damage. One of them is a pop-up. Um, but he, of course, as you can tell from the transformation mechanic, he makes for a great hybrid or pure support. Ardio does excellent with both. Ganesh, excellent with both. Same with Fafnir. Geb, I personally prefer to play pure support for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, although rollout can be quite potentially dangerous and so, so can Shockwave, Cataclysm is a percentage of the target's current health, so it can get a little bit tricky to actually use this effectively, unless you're initiating. Um, so I typically play him as a pure support. He can do an okay job hybrid, but I don't usually play him that way, especially since Stone Shield is just health and doesn't require any power. If this scaled with power, I'd probably play him hybrid a little bit more often. Jormungandr plays excellent in with hybrid, as you can see. Nice lots of damage there. Uh, the World Serpent is multiple hits in a row, so that's why you uh, don't really concern yourself too much with that lower magical power. So you can see where there is a lot of leeway here. However, at the end of the day, it is still vitally important for you to be keeping your allies alive. If you are going to play a hybrid support, your goals of keeping your allies alive does not change. All that changes is who you should be targeting. If an assassin jumps onto the onto your back line, while you and your solo are fighting off the enemy mage and solo lane, let's say, you turn around and you save your back line unless you're confident they can save themselves. Okay? Tell your, you know, yell out, retreat to your, your solo, and then go back and save your back line. If you kill the back line, that's fine. You're building hybrid, you can actually turn that into something. But, the important thing is, is that your end goals do not change. Everything I've talked about in the past three episodes still applies. You are still the primary initiator in the late game. You are still the one who's going to be counter-initiating if the enemy tries to initiate on you. You are still trying to keep your allies alive. How you do it changes slightly. Okay? I wanted to have a really important conversation about this because it is very heavily talked about. Um, and right now, Cerberus and Jormungandr are also very heavily played in the solo lane because of the amount of damage they can bring to bear, currently. It used to be Cabracken a lot of the time, and Cthulhu. Um, actually, I think it's currently Cthulhu and not so much Jormungandr, but... Regardless, 
I wanted you to be aware of the fact that you don't necessarily have to dedicate 100% of your existence to pure defense. It's just the ideal way to play support. It makes it a lot easier for you to initiate and survive. It makes it a lot easier for you to body block for your allies and them stay alive. And it's just generally the original intention of the support role. The whole death is the best crowd control, again, while technically accurate, is riskier. Now, why is it riskier? Well, as we've been discussing for quite some time here, when the support dies, there is often no one really to keep the backline alive, and they're the ones that do the damage, and they, as we've just discussed with their default protections, they tend to drop like flies. So it's generally not a good thing for the for a team to lose their support early on in a fight. It's generally really bad news. Um, but really, this is best addressed with... The idea, I think I can actually address this better by talking about out-of-role supports. And I think what I'm really going to talk about here is one that I've been seeing a lot of resurgence of, which is circuit as a support, right? So, why are people playing circuit as a support? Well, in a pro match, I can't remember what season, a pro used circuit as a support, and it was wildly successful. This was not the first time an assassin had been used as a support. Thor had been a... a... sometimes utilized support as well. Good old Thor, the original assassin. But I've been seeing Sir Ket make a resurgence as a support. But why did the pros feel like this was the move to make? Well, primarily because for an assassin, her scaling is incredibly low. Right? You've got 45% power here, you've got 50% power here, which is nice. You've got 70% here, but this is usually used as an escape anyways, so that doesn't matter a whole lot. And you have Last Breath, although they recently changed this. Originally, this was just true damage, which is... True damage is just damage that is completely unaffected by protections. So that was just 500 damage on you, regardless of what your protections were. Obviously, this was really bad for Guardians. They've changed it a little bit now, but regardless... She still acquired the reputation that she doesn't necessarily need power to do damage, especially with her passive here, where it's just a percentage of the victim's max health as physical damage with the poisons. And this is a poison, this is a poison, and this is a poison, right? Okay. So, then, what's the problem with Sir Kedis' support? Well, you're basically gambling on the ability to rack up a few kills on your team, either through Sir Ket or giving them to someone else, doesn't really matter, but using the early damage spike of an assassin support to get a few kills and snowball into a very powerful late game. The term snowball, by the way, means just an escalating advantage from a small game. You get, you know, one kill, you can roll that into two kills, roll that into three kills, now you're a level ahead, you're 500 gold ahead, you get another kill as a result because now you're stronger. You get another kill. You can you can see the trend here. And sometimes that happens. It hasn't really happened quite as much this season. Last season was really bad about snowballing. Um, but this season's really good about it. Um, but that is the idea here with a lot of out-of-roll supports. So, in a perfect world, if you're playing a support circuit you are essentially attempting to rack up some early kills that you can snowball into a really nice victory. The problem is, if this goes south, you now have an assassin with only two forms of crowd control, one of which is a 90-second ultimate, who isn't really going to be able to make the difference to, serve, uh, to keep allies alive, right? Because all you've got is these little darts as your consistent crowd control, and these are pretty hard to hit. They're not terribly accurate. They come out very fast, and they don't go very far. They're pretty tough to nail consistently, unless you have an absolute ton of practice with Sir Ket. So she doesn't really have the crowd control to effectively stay out there and set up good initiation. It's just very tough. Especially since Cobra's Kiss, you'll notice that forcing to attack nearby allies, dealing this damage again, so there's a potential that if you're blinking in and using Cobra's Kiss as your initiation, that your target might actually approach their team, which is not usually what you want when you're initiating, as we discussed previous episode. So, as a late game support, she's very inconsistent in her ability to initiate, 
and she's not going to have the default physical protections that a regular guardian would have, and finally, she's only got the two crowd controls, and once she's used her ult, she's only got one for the next minute and a half, assuming no crowd control reduction. It's very tough. Can it work? Sure, yeah. I've seen it work before. I've done it once su successfully and twice unsuccessfully. It's not generally how I like to play support. It's not my style. But I've done it once successfully. Um, it's just, it becomes a very huge late game risk. If you don't win as a circuit support by what would normally be the late game, you're basically going to be doing very little to impact fights. All right, so that's really the the that's going to be a continuous trend for most out of role uh, supports. It's not to say that they can't play support, and there are some that are actually really excellent in the support role. Um, not specifically assassins, but in general. But if you're building a hybrid support, you're you're splashing a little bit of damage on there, depending on how you splash in that damage, is going to make a big difference in whether or not you can survive your own initiation. To return to Ymir for a second, you will notice that good old, oops, Voidstone, some magic protection, some health, and some power, and a reduction of enemy magic protection by 10%. Very impressive. Now, what if I wanted to do, say, an auto-attacking hybrid Ymir? Stone of Fall would be fantastic. 40 of each protection, which is very respectable, 35 magic power, 200 health, and every time you hit an enemy with a basic attack, you get a stack of Foul's Blessing. 3% mitigations at 3 stacks, which is 9% mitigations, it doubles. 18% mitigations. And this lasts for 10 whole seconds. So if you're trying to do a hybrid Ymir and you want to go into auto attacks, Stone of Fall is something you absolutely should be buying because this will give you incredibly potent mitigations. Now, you're thinking to yourself, but Professor, 18% mitigation isn't that strong. But you have forgotten that Ymir's passive ability reduces enemies' damage by 10% whenever they're afflicted by Frostbite, which is inflicted by dealing damage to them with their abilities. 10% plus 18% is 28%, so you're mitigating over a quarter of the damage coming your way with that combination, right? And furthermore, I could still do some damage and help my allies if I built Demonic Grip. Your basic attacks reduce your target's magic protections by 10%, so your magic allies will now hit harder. Right? Just saying. Finally, if we were really dedicated to the idea, we could go into Animosity, which gives us a large amount of health, and your basic attacks deal bonus damage equal to 3% of your maximum health. Which, Ymir has a ton of health. At level 20, he by default, no items, has already almost 2600. Right? So, through 3 items, we could very effectively get some decent damage, magic protections, and help our allies deal more magic damage. And then our other three items could be pure defense. For example, we could build Contagion for Anti-Heal if we needed that. And then we could slap Gauntlet of Thebes to give our allies some defensive perks. And then we could probably clean up with, say, potentially a nice Pridwin for cooldown, or possibly Shogun's Kusari if the enemy has a lot of magic protections. You know, you've got all kinds of nifty options here. And it works really well. Just, my advice to you is, if you're new to Smite, if you're new to Smite, play a Guardian pure support. Don't build Hybrid yet. Because you are, you have to first understand how your abilities work, how you're going to get your damage, you have to understand your scaling, and you have to understand... When you're, uh, you really have to be able to understand when you should be building hybrid and when you should be building pure. And you'll be able to gauge that by playing pure support the whole time, the classic way of playing support, and then looking at your matches afterwards. Did I do well? Was I able to save my allies? Would it have been more useful if I'd been doing a bit of damage? Right? Uh, all these, you know, s very specific questions that one might ask. And that's going to be a matter of practice, especially since a lot of Guardians can do that switch between Hybrid and Pure whenever they need. 
Now, there is, of course, an interesting way in which one can really address a lot of problems with the tankiness of off-roll supports, because you'll notice I didn't necessarily talk a ton about tankiness. I mentioned the lower default physical protections, but that really only matters in the early game, and the reason why is because if we go in here, I'm just going to go in here really quick, we can build the famous L Lono's Mask. You take 15% less damage, but you deal 15% less damage and heal 15% less, right? This is something that is absolutely incredible on non-Guardian supports. Unfortunately, Guardians can't build this because that would be kind of OP, honestly. But you're wondering, well then, what do I want to, you know, what do I do then? In my case, well, you could go, oh, oh it is going to show us that. Is it? No, okay, it's going to rip us off there. Now, if you're playing support, you never build this mask, and why you will never build this mask becomes incredibly obvious. Uh, nope, you've got all your slots filled up. Who was I working on recently? Uh, yeah, you. Um, let's, uh, you have access to Rongda's mask. Now, the reason why you don't want to build this in the support role is obviously the 15% extra damage taken. This is something you might consider building if you're playing a solo lane, um, guardian for instance, or a jungling guardian, as another instance. You know, something that really wants to be doing large quantities of damage. But for support, you don't really want to be doing that. But it is kind of the guardian's version of that for an out-of-role guardian, but we'll talk about out-of-role guardians in other beginner's guides. Right now, we're focusing on the support role, which never wants to use that. But yes, that is essentially, you know, the major problems with playing hybrid, the pros and cons of playing hybrid, I should be saying, the pros and cons of pure support, because again, if your team isn't doing the damage you need, then your pure defense is not going to mean anything in the long run. Um, and I gave you Mir as an example because specifically he is the free-to-play guardian, so you know, using him as a primary example, I just think fits better. So let's talk about some characters out of role that actually make for great supports. Uh, again, if you're new to the role. Play a Guardian first. F you know, experiment with your Guardians. Find out which one you really like. I would recommend starting with Kabrakan or Ganesh because they're very forgiving, particularly Kabrakan. Ganesh is just really good for formulating the habit of I don't need kills, I don't need kills, I don't need kills. Sometimes I struggle with that. The longer I've been out of the role, the worse that is. I've recently been playing a decent amount of solo lane, so when I first started this series, I had to kind of get back into that groove. Well, not this series, but with the Kepri series. I had been playing solo for a little while, I believe a couple of months, um, with only sporadic support plays, because my cousin, who I play with semi-regularly, he's become a support main recently, so I've been letting him support, and kind of um, giving him the occasional piece of advice um, on that, and I've been playing solo as a result. So, you know, I have to get back into my, uh, my I don't need kills, I don't need kills mindset, because the solos kind of do want them. Oops. Did not actually intend to do that. But let's talk about... Okay, you're just going to have a problem now. Cool. Are we cooperating? We are cooperating. Now, a lot of out-of-role supports are going to be warriors. They have almost as high defense as the guardians do. They typically have some decent amounts of crowd control. But there are a couple that I really want to specifically shout out as being outstanding supports. Probably to the extent I prefer them in the support role over the solo lane. The first of these is Guan Yu, alright? Guan Yu has Painless, which this isn't really necessarily the biggest deal, this just buffs his abilities if he's got, if he's been slapped or attacked 20 times. Conviction, heals. I mean, it's a, unfortunately, it's what is known as a pure flat healing. There is no scaling on this. It really should have 5% scaling in my opinion, but high res please, free, uh, please buff. Uh, Warriors will, again, this isn't really supportive, this is just damage. It does provide a slow, though, which is really nice. So you've got a slow, you've got a heal, you have protection reduction. Actually, you've got protection steal, which is actually even more important, because this means Guan Yu is becoming more tanky as the enemy is losing their tankiness. So you've got a protection steal, and finally, you have a slow into stun. Right? So, yes. Guan Yu has all of the hallmarks of a really effective support. And that is lovely. Another outstanding example is Horus. First off, he's got Resolute. He just 
gains increased protections, and then he heals based on the number of times he's been hit within a specific span of time, right? Then he's got Updraft. This is a pop-up with some damage attached. Fracture. This is a stun attached to a dash, which he then follows up with an AoE auto attack. It also reduces protections by a flat amount, which is important. This is a heal. Also buffs protections of himself and an ally. This allows him to transport allies. I personally think this is too slow, but it also provides a shield for all of those traveling with him. So once again, we have crowd control, crowd control, heal, self-heal, protection buff, health shield with his ult. Again, all of the trademarks of a great support. These, hold on, there's actually one more I want to talk about, is Osiris. Fragmented, damage mitigation. Sickle strike, slow. Spirit Flail, a double slow, basically. Judgment Tether, stun and damage reduction. Lord of the Afterlife, healing elimination. Once again, as you can tell, he makes, he makes for a potentially great support. Now, these three I call my physical supports. These are usually the three I'm going to go to if my ADC is magical, right? There are a couple of other outstanding examples of really powerful supports amongst the Warriors. A shout out to Chalk, uh, who has a self heal, an attack speed slow, a movement speed slow, and a protection buff, as well as a silence with a knockback. Vaman, who has, who gains power as he gains physical protections. He's got a slow, he's got a pop up, and he's got a self heal protection buffing ult, which is really nice. Tyr has a self-heal, increased protections under one of his stances, as well as a pop-up. Odin has a self-shield, a stun, and his ultimate is a ring. You can see the, the kind of trend going on here. A lot of warriors make for particularly good supports as well. It takes a little bit of practice, and again, I, I strongly urge you, if it's your first time playing support, find your favorite guardian first. Get that guardian... Get comfortable with the Guardian, understand that Guardian, then try a physical support. I would recommend Guan Yu, Horus, or Osiris. Personally, my favorite's always been Guan Yu. I've got a soft spot for him. He's not really meta right now, though, but I think he'll surprise you. Now, let's talk about Assassins. Now, I don't really like Assassins a lot of the time as supports. They frequently lack the kinds of crowd control that they need, and they're quite squishy. Um, I've used Ravon as a uh, support before, and that was fairly effective. Ratatoskir actually is a fairly unique example because he can do wonderful and amazing things with the acorn. I'm not sure if they're going to let me show you. No, they're really not. Uh, there we go. Notice that you have two different protection or supportive type Acorns. You have the Evergreen, which gives him increased maximum health and allows him to heal himself, although I prefer Evergreen Acorn when I'm playing him in the solo lane. When I'm playing him support, I'm going to more likely be going for the Thick Bark Acorn, which is a 10% protection boost. Still heals 3% of his max health, and he now basically has the... Uh, he has a uh, protection reduction on Flurry, right? So... Ratatoskir is very unusual amongst assassins in that he's actually got a lot of pathways into a really clean support role. Especially, remember for a moment that under Thick Bark Acorn, Flurry decreases protections. Dart is a slow. Flurry gets even more um, physical protection reductions because, of course, we've got the acorn, of course, here. I'm sorry, it's not a shred here. He gets a Guan Yu effect where he steals the protections. So he gets tankier with Flurry as well as reducing their protections. He gets a stun with Acorn Blast. If you can hit all three Acorns. You have a pop-up with Through the Cosmos that also allows you to cross the map very quickly in case your allies really need help and you're out of position. Ratatos gear actually, with the Thick Bark Acorn, makes for an incredible support. Robin, I want to po uh, point out Chain of Blows. Receives a shield equal to 5% of his max health, right? So you have a health shield. You have a slow with Prana Onslaught. You have a moment of complete invincibility. A one second flip kick of immunity, which is lovely. A self heal and 10 hand shadow fist. And your ult, which gives you damage mitigation. 
he also, as you can see, makes for a pretty good support. Beyond that, the rest of these really don't, in my opinion, make for the best supports. Uh, a lot of these that do have some kind of benefit associated with them frequently make for better solo laners than that, but I did want to shout out Ratatoskar and Ravon very specifically as two assassins that I have had a lot of success with in the support role. The rest of these, it's quite a bit more difficult to get that to work because either they're too focused on damage and they really don't have too much in the way of supportive crowd control or they just function better in the solo lane. A really good example of this actually is Bakasura because he obviously has, you know, this, which doesn't really matter for supporting or solo. He's got a really interesting secondary effect of takedown where whenever he lands on somebody, they take 10% damage extra from all sources for three seconds, which is really interesting. He has a protection buff and self-heal, including mana, whenever he eats a minion. He does true damage, so he doesn't need items to deal damage, and he's got regurgitate, which slows and cripples enemies inside of that area, right? So, while on the outset it does sound like he's got really great support potential, and to some extent he does, he does play much better, in my opinion, in the solo lane, where his sustain can really be put to a little bit better use. Solo laners are a little bit more uh, interested in sustain. For... Oops. For hunters. Now, I've seen a couple of attempts at making a hunter support work, but I've only ever seen it effectively done with specifically three. Those three are on her, where you've got shifting sands, which slows the enemy, impaling an enemy either is a pushback or if they hit the wall, it's a stun. You have a knockback with disperse. His ult really isn't that useful in terms of providing any kind of supportive benefits, and this just affects all of his everything, so this is actually very effective if you've got heavy enough physical damage on your composition. It's really just the ult that doesn't serve any kind of specific purpose in terms of supporting, and even then, you could make the argument that it enfeebles the enemy, so that's really nice, but I have seen him be very useful in that role. I've seen Apollo with some success... Uh, mostly through a combination of serenades, physical protection buff to sleep, or the mesmerize as they call it, that it afflicts, and his ability to decrease the movement speed of enemies, as well as himself actually do a decent amount of damage with this as well, and his ability to rotate quickly. Uh, not my favorite example, but I've also seen Danzaburu do very well with Fool's Gold, which makes the enemy intoxicated, which makes it fairly interesting for them to attack. You've got the Saki, of course, which slows, it taunts, it heals uh, him. This, which actually is, I think, underutilized for its secondary effects. A lot of Danzaburo players use this as an escape, because, oh, you turn into a leaf, you get increased movement speed, ooh, yes, get out of there. But the actual bamboo forest, if you stay in it, you get reduced basic attack damage, which is really nice. That can make an absolutely huge difference, especially when you remember that the bane of a lot of Guardians are the Hunters, who use basic attacks. So Danzaburu, in a very strange twist, is a really well-designed Guardian against his own class, it's, which is fascinating. Also, he's got a stun on his Uproarious Rocket. And then, finally, he gets extra gold. Now, this is actually huge huge amount of benefit for a support. Because supports pretty consistently have gold problems. It happens when you're, you know, not killing minions, you're getting the assists. If you don't have, um, what is that called? Guardian's Blessing? Sentinel's Gift. Uh, when it, if you don't have Sentinel's Gift, you're going to have gold problems because you're getting the assists, not the kills, and that means less gold for you. But with dubious savings, that problem is solved, at least in the mid-game. Because obviously in the early game, 10% of your gold is going to a money pouch, so you're going to have a little bit of trouble until you hit that first pouch upgrade. Right? Then you're talking really nice amounts of gold. So Dan Zabardo actually makes for an incredibly strong support, even though he's an ADC. I mean, sorry, a hunter. So, 
just as long as you approach things with the right mindset, you can turn a lot of people into supports. For example, if Artemis was a little faster, she would actually make for a fantastic support. She's got a root cripple with her traps here. She's got a slow one, suppress the insulin. And she's got a stun, a very effective stun, on the Caledonian boar. Still, target doesn't really make a difference. And Vengeful Assault is just move speed. But, again, a nice benevolence build, an animosity build with Artemis could be very incredibly effective. So it really, again, does partially depend on how you approach those individuals. Now, there are some that you're just never going to really make into an effective support. I think the most egregious example of that would probably have to be, uh, let me see, She Blanque. All he's got in terms of supportive crowd control is a slow. <laughs> and he's technically got his really horrifically useless Darkest of Nights, which makes the enemy blind for three whole seconds, which isn't that long. Um, but I would say he would be someone I would never recommend you try and support with. Could you theoretically still do it? Yeah. You, you can theoretically still do it, and it could even be effective entirely by accident, just through pure dint of surprise. But it's not something I would consistently try to make work. Uh, again, Danzabaru is a far better option if you wanted to go there. Uh, and you know, there are various mages that make for pretty good supports. Zonkui with his boosted protections and his self-heal. Ra with his healing ability, able to also boost allies. And he's also got a slow on there. That's fairly interesting. Hades was originally a guardian before they made him a mage, and they didn't change his kit at all. Eset, actually, I want to make a quick shout out here. Funeral Rites provides additional HP and MP5 for nearby allies, so she's increasing their sustain. Wing Gust allows her to close in. Not really anything more going on there. You could use this in tandem with Gem of Isolation to make this a slow. Spirit Ball is a stun. Dispel Magic is a silence and a magic protection debuff. Or, you can shield allies with this. You can give them a little shield. Finally, Circle of Protection gives you damage mitigation, heals you at the end of the explosion. It's a delightful time. She actually makes for a surprisingly effective support, and I have had quite a few successful games with a support E-Set. It is surprisingly very effective. The early game is, of course, rough. The early game is always going to be rough with any out-of-roll support. I don't care who, you're going to, who you are. You either get first blood... Because you have the increased damage as an out-of-roll support, or you die. I mean, there's really no two ways about it. But I did want to talk about out-of-roll supports. You will see them, you will hear rumors, and I just wanted to give you at least a foundational understanding of what really actually does work in practice, what doesn't, and why it does work when it does. It comes down to the, a strong early game. Um... So I did want to talk about this overall. That's really going to be it for this particular part of the guide. Next time we'll be going back to gameplay. And we will be kind of summarizing up and talking about the various things. I will probably play a hybrid. I will probably look to go with a hybrid. But we'll definitely be going into a kind of a conversation about that in the next part. I'm not sure if I'm going to go with a hybrid guardian or if i'm going to play a uh, support out of role i'm not sure yet um but i'll definitely be doing both eventually it really depends on how i feel tomorrow when i record but i did want to give you this foundational groundwork so that way we can move on to more advanced supporting which is your various options as a support player and that's what i really enjoy about smite is the fact that yeah i i usually like playing guardians but what if i feel like playing someone a little different in the support role huh well, we can do that, and it's fantastic, if you're if you're smart about it. So, yeah, also, uh, please, while I'm on the subject, just really quick, I recommended last, at the end of last episode, if you really wanted to truly understand high-level initiation and counter-initiation, watch the pro games. I urge you, do not just blindly copy what the pros do. A lot of players do that, and a lot of players can't pull off the kinds of things that pros do. I talked about the support circuit originally, and the support Thor. These were first introduced as concepts by pros. The There is the very famous historical event of the 
Ares Walker, which was a pro player named Death Walker taking Ares into the solo lane, which was unheard of because solo lane, as I mentioned before, really likes sustain. And at that time, Ares did not have any. He's got a little bit now, but it's still not that much. And he absolutely dominated a whole season with Ares Walker, as it became known as. And that really inspired a lot of people to blindly use Ares in the solo lane without understanding the character and the role together in the same way Deathwalker did. Because what a lot of people fail to realize with the pros is that before the pros take any out-of-role character or any strat into a pro game, they practiced it for months ahead of time. So if you see a pro player pull a character out of role and play that Thor in the support role, understand that they have spent the last few months practicing that to make it effective. They saw something that might be useful either through a conversation somewhere in the community, through the forums or Reddit or whatever, or alternatively, they were just looking at the kit and had an idea pop up or whatever, and they just practiced, practiced, practiced. All right? Just keep that in mind. Don't just blindly go into it. Ask yourself the very honest question, do I play in a way that would make that work? If the answer is no, I don't care how cool it looks, walk away. There are ways that the pros play out of role supports that I just cannot do. I was able, with some practice, I was able to get Ares Walker to work. Not as effectively as Death Walker because I hadn't practiced it as long. It took me about two weeks of practice to make that work, with about three matches roughly every night. To even get that basically to work, and even then I still had trouble against specific matchups. I have still never gotten Thor support to work, because that's just not how I play. The way I play support is so separate from how Thor support has to play, with that high early game aggression, and then you kind of scale it back at the end. I don't play like that, that's not how I like playing. So, I can't get Thor support to work. I'm great with Thor and jungle, some of the time, it really depends. I have a kind of a love-hate relationship with Thor, but I can't get Thor support to work. I just It's just not how I play. Sirket support, I got to work when it was really big. I don't think I could get it to work now. She, The items have changed enough where I, I really am not 100% sure I could get that to work the same way. I might be able to get it to kind of work today, but not necessarily as well today. But there are other gods out of role that I can play really well that maybe other people can't. For example, Guan Yu. I can play a support Guan Yu 50 different ways and be very successful with all of them. I remember back in the day I used to do as an attack speed support Guan Yu. It sounds insane and moronic, and it was, but it was also incredibly effective. Strangely, but that was in a younger day with completely different items than we have now, and I I probably could closely recreate it, but I don't think it would be quite as effective in the long run. It's something I want to get back into trying at some point um, in the future, uh, but we're not going to worry about that now. But those are just some examples. You know, I've been playing the I've been playing this game for years, uh, potentially even longer than some of the pros currently active. Um, it really depends on the individual pro. And there are pros that have retired from the pro scene that have been playing longer than I have, obviously, and. Frankly, there's going to be people out there who will be able to play certain characters out of role that I can't, and vice versa. So, just because you see somebody play such and such a character out of role doesn't necessarily mean it'll work for you, but then you might try something, you might see some way of using a character out of role that nobody else has, and you might be one of the few that can play it that way, and maybe a couple of people will be able to imitate you really successfully, but a lot of people won't, as an example. Um, it really depends on your playstyle, your comfort with that character, your knowledge of the role, and how it all, you know, comes together. But playstyle is a big part of it. So, once you've really figured out the role, and you've figured out, you know, your favorite guardian that you can fall back on, if you really need, like, a, a f refresher, uh, a self-refresher, then, um, yeah, feel free to explore. Um, but explore with three plans. Uh, explore with the idea of, okay, the enemy team has a balance of magic and physical damage, the enemy team has a predominantly physical presence, and the enemy team has a predominant magic presence. Write them down if you need to. Because the worst thing you can do is try something new and not have a plan going into it. Alright? If you're going to play out of role, and you've never played that character out of role before, 
plan it. And support is really easy to plan for because you can you can basically write down three specific responses based on the enemy's composition, right? Unlike solo lane where it's very hard to plan beforehand because the solo lane is very counter buildy. They they counter build a lot. And it's very easy to play out of role in ADC because they only have two different builds right now. And again, it's much harder to play a, a character out of role in the jungle or mid because those are somewhat reliant upon certain factors such as the skill of your jungler, the skill of their jungler, your ability to place wards, etc. They rely a lot on those kinds of things. And again, when I go on to beginner's guides to those two roles, I will talk about those more in depth. But I did want to put a disclaimer down here that yes, you can play out of role and I believe you, dear viewer, can do something cool out of role, but you have to be smart about it, and you can't necessarily assume that because somebody else can play such and such a character out of role that you can. Not necessarily how it works. It majorly comes down to playstyle. Be honest with your playstyle. I play support a little more aggressively than I should. This is a common failing of mine. I know this for a fact. I struggle with this all the time. You know, reining myself in and not accidentally abandoning my allies in my strong desire to either scare off or outright kill an enemy. It's a bad habit as a support. I've actually been doing really well with it now that I'm back in the groove, but if I were to wander away from the support role for a week, two weeks, a month, I would begin to struggle with that again because I would have been playing something that actually gets kills. So I do know that I have this inherent aggression, this mild inherent aggression with my gameplay, and I need to kind of slow myself back there. But I could really utilize that effectively if I were to play Dan Zaboru as a support, if I were to play Ravon as a support, because they do a little bit more damage, and I actually could get away with it, as an example. But if it is very important, at the very least, if you're new to the role, to play pure support so you understand the purity, the pure version of the role. Once you understand how pure supports build, because that's going to be, you know, the majority of your enemy supports, then you can move into hybrid. Then you experiment with hybrid, right? But understand the pure support build first. And, again, don't prioritize kills. Even if you're building hybrid, don't prioritize them. It's still not your goal. With that being said, thank you all very much for joining me with this. I hope this helped you. And if you liked this, please like and subscribe. If you didn't, please ignore me. And as always, leave any comments, questions, concerns, ideas, suggestions, or requests. Please leave them down in the comment section below. Uh, have a great 24 hours.